Well, good morning. And thank you, Sean, for that kind introduction, which I wrote. <laughs> I want to thank Bob Schiffman for inviting me back to MP. It's been a while uh, since I had a wonderful time in Providence, Rhode Island, met with so many of you wonderful people and had an opportunity uh, to show you then if you were there, you remember my demonstration of taking a bag of sugar out of my bag and showing you how much sugar there is in actually a bottle of Coke. So I want to thank Molly and I want to thank Bob for inviting me back and Eric for hosting this webinar. Today I want to talk about what is a warning? <clears throat> what is it really? How do you define it both legally and in real life? When do you need a warning? What's the legal requirements you have to have? How do you create a warning? And then I want to give you some samples of warnings and uh, some silly ones when we get out of, uh, out of uh, sync with what reality is. What is the legal definition of a warning? Now, I'm talking about product warnings. I'm not talking about uh, warnings that you give your kids uh, to come to dinner or not. I'm not talking about financial warnings. I'm talking about products that we buy and use every day in our lives like a microwave oven. What is the legal definition of a warning? It's a message that alerts a product user of a pending danger, a danger that may be associated with its use. Now, practically, that means that it, it's a safety message. That's what we're talking about first and foremost, a safety message that tells you what the dangers are that may be associated with the product. And what can happen to you as a result of being exposed to those dangers? And finally, what do you need to do or not do so you won't get hurt or killed and avoid the consequences? When do you need a warning? Well, first of all, you need it when you have a danger that may be associated with a product as it's being used as it's, as it's supposed to be used. So if your microwave oven is dangerous in some way, when I, the consumer, are using it, we call that a foreseeable danger, something I could see as the manufacturer in advance that might happen. Well, you don't necessarily need the warning. If I know about it as the manufacturer, I'm expected to know about it. And this is very important. In all the lawsuits I've ever been involved with, the one thing a manufacturer can't hide behind is I didn't know this. You're the manufacturer, you have to be responsible. So in legal terms, we say the manufacturer knew or should have known, and most courts will hold that up. However, you might know it, but I'm the consumer and I may not know it. The danger is not known or obvious to me, the product's user. In two words, I summarize this as the hidden hazard. If you have a hidden hazard that you, the manufacturer, should know about, and I may not know about as the consumer, then you have a responsibility to warn. Now, here are the legal requirements. Your lawyers will tell you. Adequacy of a warning, because I told you when you need to warn, you need to warn when you have a hidden hazard, a hazard that you know about or you should know about associated with any of your products, and the consumer is not necessarily likely to know about. It. If the consumer knows about the hazards, we call it open and obvious, like a knife is sharp, courts will sometimes, most of the time, will say, you didn't have to warn because consumers are supposed to know common sense, knives are sharp. Although now my, my able staff is looking at a bunch of products like the, we have a case involving a mango slicer. And the question is, how sharp is sharp? And uh, we've got a few cases like that. So it's not as open and obvious to just say all knives are sharp. Anyway, back to legal requirements. A legal requirement for an adequate warning. Once you've decided you have a hidden hazard and you've got to have a warning, well, what makes a good warning? Well, this is what most courts will accept and most professional standards association, ANSI, the American National Standards Institute, which I'm a member, these are what the uh, criteria of a hazard, of a warning uh, must include. 
is the hazard or danger clearly communicated? Clearly communicated so that the time of purchase or use, the user, that's me, the consumer, will know at the time I buy or use this product, clearly understand what the danger or the hazard is. If it's an electrical hazard, will I understand it? If it's a fire hazard, will I understand it? If it's an inhalation hazard, will I clearly understand it? If it's a swimming pool, shallow water hazard, will I understand it? I mean, I just pulled this one off of a company client of mine. Fall hazard, very simple words, two words, fall hazard. So that's the first thing. Consequences. So what? So it's an electrical hazard. So what? It's shallow water. So what? It's an inhalation hazard. So what? What does that mean? What are the consequences of being exposed to a fall hazard that I just showed you? Well, the obvious one is you could fall and hurt yourself. You say, well, that might not be serious. I just finished two lawsuits where the plaintiff fell off of a four step step ladder, three steps and the top rung. He was standing on the top rung, which you're not supposed to do. And he ended up in quadriplegia, paralyzed for life. All of his limbs are not, no longer in use. So are the consequences detailed so that you, the consumer, I, the consumer, can understand what can happen to me? How can I suffer as a result of being exposed to the danger? So you have to communicate the danger and the consequence to exposure to the danger. Thirdly, remember, you have to tell somebody, okay, now I know what can happen to me. What can I do? What can I do or what shouldn't I do? So these are instructions. They've got to be clear and comprehensible and not a long Mercedes-Benz list of things and not tiny print, as we'll talk about. So that way that I can understand what I need to do or not do to avoid the consequences associated with the hazard. Finally, the courts say, is this warning communicated in a conspicuous manner? And the legal term for conspicuous very specifically is in a reasonably prudent person at the time of purchase or use, see or hear that warning. And I say here also because audible warnings are a big part of what I do. So it's verbal warnings and audible warnings and visual warnings. Now, in terms of making a warning more conspicuous, we have a whole bunch of uh, things in our bag of tricks making the colors bright, you know, I held up one and I'll do more later. You see red, white, and black, that's the danger. Font size is big, print, borders around the phrase, capital letters, both. You can do a lot of these things. And research shows the more of this that you pay attention to, the more likely the uh, warning will be seen, or if it's audible, loud volume, uh, beeping sounds, flashing lights, things like that. Uh, those will get the attention. And that's the whole purpose. The warning has to get your attention. Now, clients call me all the time and they say, Jerry, I need to evaluate the warnings I have. I've got some, and I don't know if they're good or bad, if they'll hold up in court or not, if they're adequate or inadequate. Or they'll call me up and say, Jerry, I don't have any warnings. Do I need them? So first question is, they'll say to me, Jerry, help me write warnings. And I say, wait, whoa, first question, do I need the warning? So I do an analysis. So I have a three-phase process. Let's just go over it briefly with you. What are the three phases that you as a manufacturer should engage in uh, in determining if you need warnings and how to create them and how to evaluate them if you already have them? First and foremost, let me show you that warnings have been a very recent phenomenon in terms of looking at the articles published and the standards, organizations, the federal regs, and uh, product warnings actually on products. Since the 90s, it's exploded. But if you look back into the early part of the 20th century, not much was going on. There was very little in the field of warnings that was happening. A little bit in the 70s, you started to see people like me publishing articles and talking, 
about it and you start to see professional organizations come about. There's a whole history of how warnings got developed, but the thing exploded in the 1990s to the point now where 99.8, that's virtually every products liability lawsuit has a failure to warn claim in it. And most of those lawsuits, and having done this for 42 years, I can tell you most of those lawsuits have been adjudicated on the warnings claim rather than the product defect claim. They may file a defect claim, but most of the products we make today are not defective. So they'll try to come in with the warning defect as the main source of recovering damages. So failure to warn has emerged as the primary litigating issue in most lawsuits that have to do with products liability. Again, these slides just show you the growth in publications and the warnings literature, the growth in the use of standards applied to the development of good warnings by trade groups like ANSI and others, ASTM and so on. Oh, and if you notice the federal regs started to grow up in the 1970s, the regulatory agencies that we're most familiar with were created. I like to call them the consumer president, uh, the warnings president. You probably didn't realize this, but it's Richard Nixon. In 1972, he created OSHA. In 70, OSHA, 72, the Consumer Product Safety Commission, uh, the, uh, uh, the National Highway Traffic Safety Administration was created by Nixon. And Nixon had a lot to do with the regulatory environment, but most of these regs didn't take place. Uh, the FDA is the exception. That goes back to the turn of the century, turn of the 20th century. And actually, companies getting involved in putting product warnings on. Uh, the, big, the big shift occurred after the Surgeon General's report in 1964 when Luther Allen put the, the first, it was a lukewarm uh, warning uh, that he put out saying, caution, cigarettes may be hazardous to your health. But once the congressional warnings came out for tobacco, industry started to pay attention and say, well, if it could happen to tobacco, it could happen to us. So many clients. And then in 1992, something amazing happened. I was involved with McDonald's for a number of years as their market research vendor. We did a lot of surveys and focus groups. One of the things we found was that companies, uh, the customers from McDonald's were complaining their coffee wasn't hot enough to go through the drive-in window and get to the office and have it hot. So McDonald's said, great, well, let's juice the coffee up and make it 30 degrees hotter in our competition, and let's advertise that our coffee will always be hot. And so they did, and to this day, it's the same. However, in 1992, everybody heard about an 81-year-old woman named Stella Liebig from Albuquerque who sued McDonald's when the, war, when the coffee spilled on her and scalded her groin, and she had a third-degree burns, and the McDonald's refused initially to settle it. They tried the case. Uh, Stella Liebig won eight. She won a half a million, $700,000 judgment. McDonald's appealed it and got her down to about 500000 and paid the bill. All of the comedians at the time, the big ones were Jay Leno and David Letterman, they made her a poster person for uh, silly warnings. I haven't been involved in that. And I can tell you that it was anything but a silly warning. If you go to the Ralph Nader uh, Torch Museum in Connecticut, they have a whole display up there. And he told me before I wrote my new book, uh, which I'll hold up again, Murder, Inc., Murder, Inc., How Unregulated Industry Kills or Injures Thousands of Americans Every Year and What You Can Do About It. Um, and when I was doing the research for Murder, Inc., I visited with Ralph Nader and uh, he showed me the exhibit on uh, McDonald's. It turns out there were 750, I believe, prior Stella Liebigs to the original one in 1992. In other words, McDonald's had had 790 or so prior lawsuits about hot coffee, but nobody had heard about them because of the NDA. And that's the game of hide and seek that we see too often. Somebody gets hurt or injured, companies get the, the injured party, take a settlement quickly and sign a non-disclosure agreement. Turns out 792 people did that with McDonald's and nobody knew what had actually happened. Since that the lawsuit, if you notice the chart here in the 1990s and up, warnings started to explode because people started to say, wait a minute, if McDonald's can get nailed, 
on something that everybody thought was silly, it's hot coffee. And it really wasn't silly because nobody knew how hot was hot. Nobody knew that McDonald's had heated the coffee 30 degrees or so more. So at any rate, now let's go into how we do a warning. First phase is we gather information. We do an analysis which helps us determine whether we need a warning or not. And there's some steps to this. What data do I look at? I look at what we call, first of all, a hazard analysis. I try to identify and I ask my clients, staff, how can I get hurt? If you think about a very simple question, I'm reminded of the movie Philadelphia when the attorney played by Denzel Washington asked the injured party, uh, Tom Hanks, who was an attorney who had contracted HIV AIDS. And he said to Denzel Washington, said to Tom Hanks, tell me as an eighth grader or an elementary school, pretend I'm an elementary school student, how can I get hurt? How can I get there? So that's what I tell my clients. When I meet with them the first day with the engineers, I say, how can I get hurt? How can I get killed? Now, first, you know, the good engineers say, yeah, you can't, you gotta be stupid. I say, okay, we're not gonna leave this room until you tell me, how can I get hurt? How can I get killed? So that's a hazard analysis. I wanna know the numbers. I wanna know how many people have been injured or killed over a period of time since the product's been out there. I wanna know how many people are using the product, how they're using it, and so on. This is a hazard analysis. And the next thing I look at is a competitor analysis. I'm not proud. I'd like to know uh, what other people have done. I'd like to know what others have done. I would like to know if my competitor, state of the art, we call it. If anybody else has warnings, I'd like to know what they are. If they have instructions, what are they? So that's the second thing I like to gather. Third thing, I look at regulations. I like to look at the government and the, and the government regs, the codes and standards from the federal and state agencies. I like to look at trade groups. I mentioned the, the IEEE, I mentioned uh, on my way to visit Nader, I stopped with my son at a greasy spoon outside this town that Nader's museum is in. And there's nobody in there. And a guy walks in, sits next to me. It turns out he's the one of the top leaders of the IEEE. And we we're talking about what I'm doing and what my new book's about. And he said, that's what we're trying to do. And they form a thing called the Global Initiative. And he asked me if I'd be on it. So I accepted. And the Global Initiative are 100 members of the IEEE who have gotten together and have said to their members, hey, develop the warnings ahead of time before you market the product. This couldn't be something more. I, I couldn't agree more with this. So I was glad to help out. At any rate, regulatory analysis. And if I'm writing warnings or I'm deciding whether you need warnings, I wanna be sure that the federal and state codes, if they say you need certain kinds of warnings, I wanna be sure I'm up to date on that. And my library in Western New York, where my home office is in Buffalo, uh, we have the largest library in the world of all the codes and standards, regulations and literature in the field of warnings, which we make available to all of our clients. Next, I look at marketing analysis. Let me tell you a quick story. I had a client in the swimming pool industry. He said, Jerry, I need to get out and put some warnings on about this shallow water diving thing. And I'll show you some of those later. And I, and I said, let me look at all your data that you're using to market. And he's an in, in-ground swimming pool. That's not, I mean, a above-ground swimming pool. And above ground pool, they're all three and a half, four feet high. And by definition, you shouldn't dive into them. But anyway, he had actual letters that went out on his letterhead, showed somebody diving into his pool. So you really need to be sure that you're not going to get hoisted by your own petard. I had Fisher Price as a client for years, and uh, they wanted me to help them out with some products, toy products. And I said, well, let's look at the warnings you've got on your other products, because you didn't want cross purposes, one, one product doing better than the other. So marketing stuff is very important. You have to have your marketing and sales information uh, in sync with each other. And they can't be across purposes. I had a client in the soft drink industry, uh, this, this diet, uh, a seven up Dr. Pepper, Canada Dry, it was all Cadbury beverages at one point. And, uh, as soon as I put the warnings up for the exploding bottle cap, I shouldn't say exploding, the bottle cap that could blow off when you shake the bottle. As soon as I put the warnings on, their marketing people 
kept hiding my warnings with ads on the front of the bottle. So I used to keep going back to the CEO and say, hey, get those marketing people off my warnings. So we have to be sure we're not working at cross purposes. Safety information is first and foremost the purview of what I do. Also, I want to look at when I'm deciding whether to warn or not or how to warn is uh, I want to look at their litigation history. What is the actual litigation history? Have you been sued before? Have claims been filed? Do you have complaint files? I'd like to look at it all and see what the failure to warrant issues have been in the past. Second phase of the three phases is where I now critique existing warnings based on the data I've collected from my hazard analysis and competitors and all that stuff, litigation. I now want to critique what you've done. Now I'm in a position to either look at the ones you've got or design new ones if you need them, if you don't have any. So I can't, now I sit down and that's where the art comes in. That's where I personally, I've got a large team work with me, but I, I'm the guy, I'm the artist who personally designs the warnings. And now under most courts, uh, when I work a case, the lawyers, if I'm on the plaintiff's side, I, I'm probably half and half, but if I'm on the plaintiff's side, the judges will not let me get up there and say, here's what's wrong. I have to say, not only here's what's wrong, but here's what I would do differently. It's called alternative design. So, and the engineers have to do that too. If they're going to critique a product and claim defect, they have to introduce in a lawsuit a, uh, an alternative design, a better way of doing it. So I always design warnings and instructions for every lawsuit I'm involved in because I wouldn't be involved if it were all good. So I have to have the better way to do things. And I follow all the codes and standards. And follow. Then the third phase is testing and evaluating. Anything I do in the field of communication, we have to determine the effectiveness and a warning is a form of communication. It's a safety message. And I need, like in any other form of communication, I need to find out if the message has been received and understood. Notice I didn't say acted on, I said received and understood. My job in communication and in safety communication and in warnings is to make sure my warnings are likely to be seen and understood. I am in charge of getting you to the water. I can't make you drink it. I want to bring you into the showroom, but I can't make you buy the car. I want you to understand the hazards with that microwave oven, if there are any, but I can't make you behave in a certain way. Bob Schiffman and I have collaborated on some cases in the past, and uh, you'd be surprised at how silly uh, some people are in their use of microwave ovens, which is certainly dangerous. So the question is, should they have been adequately warned by the products? Were they adequately warned? So I want to test. In order to determine if the warning is effective, meaning it's the message has been received and understood, I have to test the warnings. And I use various uh, uh, measurements that, not surprising, involve focus groups, mall intercept studies, uh, surveys, and so on. Um, these are techniques that we've been using over the years. And I try to find out if people understand what they're getting or if they even see them. I was doing uh, tests for a, a corporate client, make commercial air conditioners. And we went all over the country and did focus groups of people who install the air conditioners. And these are maintenance and installation people. They're the ones at risk of the hazards with these large commercial air conditioners, which happen to be uh, hazards that dealt with electrical shock, it had to do with uh, losing your fingers because the the speed of the uh, rotating blades, and it had to do with uh, uh, one other hazard that I'm slipping on. The uh, these hazards, the electrical hazard, the uh, uh, cutting your fingers off hazard, these hazards uh, were I demonstrated in warnings that I put up all over the uh, air conditioning units. Had the people look at them without telling them what this was a test of. I said, I want you to look at the air conditioning units and I'll get your opinion. I have pictures, video of people within a half an inch of my warnings 
who then when asked, did you see them, they'd say, no. <laughs> so I'm very humbled by the fact that I can, I, I use these tests to improve what I do. Because uh, as much as I've been doing this for 42 years, you, you always can do better. And there can be factors involved that you don't realize. So testing ahead of time is very important. Before I let a warning out, I want to test them. I mentioned uh, some effective warnings I want to show you. You'll notice this is one I did for the swimming pool industry. This is on most pool, well, it should be on most pools around the country. Uh, you'll notice the four ingredients that I mentioned that have to be in a warning. One, there has to be a signal word. In this case, the word is danger. Why danger? Because the danger or the risk of harm is immediate and life-threatening. You know, if, if it's not immediate, you could put the word warning on. But if you dive into shallow water and, and you hit that angle at the right angle, you will become a quadriplegia very quickly. It's immediate, it's life-threatening. So thus the word danger. Notice the two-word statement of hazard, shallow water. Hazard statement. Danger, shallow water. You can be paralyzed. Consequence. We did national studies, by the way, and found out that over 95% of swimmers who dived into pools or dived into water bodies understood what the word paralyzed meant. And so we used the word paralyzed after extensive testing. So the consequence, you can be paralyzed. That's the third thing. And finally, Two words, the instruction, no diving. You'll notice this sign also has a pictogram on it. I tested a number of pictograms, and this is one I personally designed. And it shows the beetle-like figure diving into a pool of water, the two lines looking like water, and then the handicap sign at the bottom. I got over a 90%, which is ANSI's uh, criterion for acceptable understandability of a, of a pictogram, and I got 90% who, in absence of the words, they knew what the picture meant, and that is that uh, uh, this is a dangerous situation. Notice the colors I used, red, white, and black. Those are the ANSI recommended colors for when you use the word danger. This is an effective warning. It's brief, to the point, it's conspicuous, and it works. It's very effective. How do I know? I tested it. I tested this warning all over the country. I tested it on men, women, boys and girls, high school, junior high. Uh, I tested this on several thousand people around the United States. And now I wasn't waiting for people to dive in and become quadriplegic. We can't do that in the field I'm in. But I was able to put the warnings up and have people uh, saw, uh, dive into pools. I have people up there on the, uh, on, in high schools, for example, with warnings and without warnings and then find out if there were differences in perception of the hazard. Here's another one. And this one's in Spanish on the right, because I had to be very concerned about the use of Spanish in uh, one third of America speaks Spanish. So you've got to be particular attention to the use of Spanish, uh, in, in particularly in Texas, California, New York, other states. This is a ladder warning. You notice this one? This is the one I told you about, the step ladder. And the danger of the racking hazard. Again, it's a danger because it's imminent. Racking is the hazard. Racking means jumping the ladder, moving it while you're on it. And uh, you have to make sure you've got the right ladder. And again, I put this one in Spanish. So that's an example of another effective warning. Here's what I did for the ATV, all-terrain vehicle industry. This was approved by the federal consent degree in 1986. My client was every company that makes ATVs, and it was the government, the Consumer Product Safety Commission. And uh, this was to keep young kids off the uh, ATVs. And we told them they could die. We had the pictogram. We had the word warning. Now, I wanted danger. We had to settle on this because it was a political operation. So we used the word warning because they convinced the uh, Consumer Product Safety Commission that it's not everybody uh, who who goes off an ATV will end up injured. And uh, finally, I mentioned the water heater. I put this on. It's a lot of wordy, but a lot of it's mandated by the industry. And this is to prevent people from uh, keeping their water heater near flammable vapors in your garage or in your basement. 
uh, or in your attic. Now, uh, the last thing I'll say is that we can sometimes go crazy uh, with warnings. I'm a safety guy. I believe in warnings. I believe you should warn when you need to warn. I believe you should warn when you need to warn. I don't believe you should warn when you don't need to warn. I have recommended many times to clients they don't need to warn because the hazard doesn't exist or the hazard is so open and obvious that uh, it's, it's hard to imagine why you would need to warn. So with that as background, I would say to you that lawyers sometimes get into the act a little too much and they say, well, let's put warnings on anyway. I don't like that. I know they're trying to uh, uh, protect their clients, but when you put too many warnings on a product or you have too many warnings in general, I'm reminded of what the former late C Chief Justice of the Supreme Court, William Rehnquist, once said in a speech he gave to the American Bar Association. He said, memorably, if you warn about everything, you warn about nothing. And we create a cynical society, an overwarned society. I happen to know a lot about this because I've written several books about information overload and the communication process. And when you tell too much information, people can't process it and they tend to turn off. And when they see too many warnings, they, ah, it's another warning, forget about it. So I tell all my clients, let's pick and choose the warnings that you need to have because of the hidden hazards and because of the severity of the consequences to exposure to those hidden hazards. So that's what I tell them. Now, not always do people listen. And as a result, we end up with sometimes some silly warnings. Now, those, the earliest ones were the uh, skull and bones. This goes way back. But we now sometimes have, every year I have a top 10 silly warnings thing. And this one was one we actually found on a child's stroller. Remove the child before folding the stroller. This was really a, a real warning. It's out there today. And uh, that would not be exactly a client I would recommend warning about that. These are on the Buffalo Bills. Decals will not prevent you from any bodily harm or injury. I guess uh, the Buffalo Bills, which I point out, that's my hometown team. Uh, that's a wacky warning. I guess some kids, maybe they put them on there, prevent, think you're Superman. This is actually on a can of a, an Epson printer cartridge, toner cartridge. Don't drink the cartridge. Don't drink the ink. That's another one of these wacky warnings. Here's one, catfish nuggets, frozen catfish that says contains fish. Uh, as I point out, you've been on planes, well, when we used to fly before COVID, and they say on the bags of peanuts, contains peanuts. Okay, okay, thank you for that. Appreciate it. Now, don't get me wrong. I'm involved as a, a defendant. Uh, I'm helping out Whole Foods right now in a lawsuit where they've been sued for failure to warn about the attic. the presence on their salad bar of pine nuts in a salad had to do with the, where the warning label was. And I've got, I've got some other ones now with popcorn industry and the popcorn, uh, whether they're adequately warned about, I can't go into the details on that. At any rate, here's another one. I've told you about sharps, knives are sharp, but uh, here's one that actually does say blades are sharp. And this is a utility knife. So um, knives are sharp, which is, by the way, the classic taught in the uh, war in the law schools today as the open and obvious warning. But yet here we go. And here's another one, uh, the famous uh, phaser used in Star Wars. This won the award one year for the silliest warning. And uh, don't use this laser as a battle device. Okay. So that's what I wanted to tell you. I wanted to tell you a little bit about what a warning was. I wanted to tell you what a, a warning wasn't, what a good warning is, what one isn't, what you need to have a warning, when you need to warn, why you need to warn. 
And uh, let's open it up for some questions. If I can shut this off, let's see here. Oh, I got my PowerPoint. Anyway, Thanks, Gary. thank you uh, all. I, uh, uh, I have a comment for your wacky label, although I no longer have the device. I, uh, because of where I live, I would put a sunshade um, on the dashboard of my car when I parked. And uh, the, one of the shades that I had had a warning saying, please remove shade before driving. So I've seen that one. I brought it with me on CBS Morning News once. She was, uh, okay. she asked for silly warnings and I brought that one on. I said, this is all over the state of Florida. <laughs> the, uh, any warm climate, anywhere you put a sunshade, uh, remove before driving. I'm glad you did that, Eric. <laughs> so, yes, well, that's why one of the reasons I'm still here, I think. Is there um, anything you've ever seen on a, a food package or that you thought was either taught you something about the product or you thought was a well-done warning? Well, you're hitting on an area I happen to be very interested in, and that's the whole food industry. Um, I believe that, and I was a, I provided input to the FDA, as some of you know, on the development of the food and nutrition labeling. My input was limited to the way we communicated about sugar both its presence and the amount. And as you all know, or many of you know, uh, the FDA recommended, and uh, despite objections from the current administration, finally was implemented the changes in the food and nutritional label so that now two words are used, added sugar, as opposed to the 50 or 60 words that were hiding sugar in plain sight, which was, I thought, bad communication. So... The other half of it is it's still being communicated in grams, which is the metric system. Now, I will state that I've done national studies on this, which I've submitted to the FDA, that only 5% of the country understands the metric system. Despite our best efforts as educators, and I was one for years, uh, America has not adopted the metric system. Right or wrong, we haven't. I'm not here to talk about whether we should or shouldn't. I'm saying we haven't, it isn't, and metric is like speaking Greek. Now, in the food industry, you guys know that. So when you communicate in Greek, you're doing a disservice to the American consumer. So when you ask me about labeling that I look at in the food industry, the first thing I would say to everybody is, Grandma taught us better than you. Grandma told us about teaspoons. We all grew up knowing, and in Yiddish it was a bissel, a bissel. We kind of translated bissels to teaspoons. But a little bit of this, a little bit of that. Grams was something we never learned. So when you sell a soft drink, as Coke does, or Mountain Dew that has anywhere from uh, 55 to 78, 77 grams of sugar, it's really a question of does the public understand how dangerous that could be? And that's the whole point. You should be communicating and labeling in language that the people understand. If, if anyone out there in this webinar is involved in the food company that's communicating in grams, if I could have an impact on you for doing the right thing, then this will be well, the best way I've spent my time in a long time. Change it from grams and metric and go back to the imperial system. People in America, and I've measured it, understand uh, ounces, they understand pounds, they understand uh, teaspoons. They don't understand liters and uh, and they don't understand uh, grams. And so I'm not going to impugn motivation on why you guys keep doing this, but I am going to suggest with the strongest loving words I can to engage what I call in my new book, principled disclosure. Tell the truth. Tell it in a way that people will understand. Because when we measure efficacy of communication, the first thing we measure is, did they get the message? And secondly, did they understand it? And since I know 95% of America doesn't understand metric, I know that your labeling is not being understood. So thank you for that question. I appreciate it. Okay. Uh, we, we do have a couple more coming in through the chat function. 
How do you handle warnings on small containers? Um, for example, one ounce depilatory in an overwrap carton, or is it sufficient to put a warning on the container? It's a very good question because in the warnings industry, size matters, okay? And the, uh, you need to be as big as you possibly can in terms of the font size, the location of the warning. Remember, the legal term is conspicuous. It has to get the attention of the average user at the time of purchase and or use. That means that you have to rely on many channels of communication. And if your packaging is so small and the print is so tiny, I mean, look no further than your average pharmaceutical uh, warning sheet. Nobody reads those. The first thing you do is rip off the bag where your, your prescription drug is in and throw it away. But if you did look at it, it's the smallest print possible. So you have to rely on certain other channels of communication. Many people are using the web to communicate warnings. I mentioned Fisher Price. If you go to their web page right now, fisherprice.com, open it up. It's right on the front page, all the recalls, safety recalls on products, on their toys. It's doing a service to the public. So they're using their web uh, Oral warnings, advertisements. Now, I mentioned Big Farmer. If your company is doing television advertising, I would advise you not. And I told the FDA, the TV ads for Big Pharma, and this is featured in my book, are absolutely a deliberate effort com combining the efforts of the FDA and the Big Pharma to communicate, hiddenly hiding the hazards, not communicating them. If you notice the thing in common, television is a visual medium. That means we look at pictures. We don't pay attention as much to the words as the pictures. So while the uh, doctor or whoever is reciting that this product will kill you and your mother-in-law, they're putting up beautiful pictures of grandma and grandpa throwing a football in Central Park with the sun out and Fido's barking at the side or a handsome man or a beautiful woman playing with their children and bouncing them around in the park. All those visuals are being shown while the warnings are being presented, all with the approval of the FDA. So that's bad. That's not good communication. If you're going to use small products, you need to rely on television, then please, by all means, use the medium to communicate the warnings. If I were doing a big farmer ad, I'm old enough to remember Marcus Welby in his white coat selling cigarette ads for cool with his stethoscope on, and there was Robert Young peddling uh, the Kent Micronite filter wearing his white coat. Well, have a real doctor this time and have that real doctor saying, I'm Dr. Jones. I'm the head of uh, surgery at Mount Sinai Hospital. And uh, while I think there may be benefits in prescribing, pick your drug of choice, I want you also to be aware of these are the real hazards. And he's sitting behind his desk looking very doctor-like. That's different than having grandma and grandpa bouncing Fido in the park while somebody in the background is reciting the warnings at warp speed. So television can help if your packaging is too small. Uh, you're going to have to make it as big as you possibly can. Uh, it, it, the, the product warnings for cigarettes, the small packs of cigarettes in England consist of the word danger on the whole pack on the front of the pack. They don't even have the word Marlboro. It's in tiny print. It just says danger, deadly, words like that. So you're going to have to maximize the font as best you can on small products. Use other media, audible warnings if it's a product where you can use them. For example, in train tracks, we have flashing lights and we have bells and whistles. When trucks back up, we have beep, beep, beeping. So uh, there are other ways of communicating that we should consider. And I mentioned in the case of swimming pools, oral warnings are important. You have to warn the parents who then use oral warnings to warn the children. So there's a lot of different channels of communication we should consider. It shouldn't all be coming down to just a warning label or just instructions on a package, although all of that is important too. All right, uh, let's see. Oh, next uh, next question. Uh, 
For cases where instructions are given uh, to the customer on use, is a warning necessary if the consumer deviates from the instructions? Yes, let me separate. That's a darn good question. Thank you very much for asking that question. There is a difference between a warning and instructions. Too often people confuse the two. They think that the instructions are adequate as warnings because we're telling you what to do or what not to do in product assembly, maintenance, and usage. That's what they are, though. Those are the do's and don'ts. They do not tell you the hazards. I've got a case right now involving a, uh, uh, an ultraviolet, uh, not ultraviolet, it's a blue light uh, device. In these days of Zoom, we should all pay attention. You're staring at the screen too much. I'm telling you right now, I'm, by the way, my brand at CNN and in all my media, my podcast, my book, as the warnings doctor. So the warnings doctor is going to tell you, watch out for blue light because over, the, over time it can really harm your retina and there are cases of blindness uh, as a result. So in the dental uh, trade where blue light is used to seal crowns and cavity fillings, the uh, blue light uh, has an instruction manual and it says uh, use goggles. But it's in this case right now, I just took it on, I'm litigating it and I took on the plaintiff because they didn't tell what the literature has shown to be, and I looked the literature up, the, the damage to the uh, retina that can occur from overexposure to blue light in absence of safety goggles. So that's an instruction, wear goggles. A warning, which we're now gonna put on the box, which I'd show you, but I just sent it back to the client. On the box, I would put right on the front, cause it's a big white box, perfect. I'm in the real estate business, folks. I'm all about location, location, location. And this big white box, I'm going to put a three by five danger. Do not use uh, this device without safety goggles. You may damage your eyes or you may cause blindness and so on. So that's a warning. The instruction is use safety goggles. You say, well, what's the difference? The difference is that the instructions typically, and this was in a booklet that had 34 pages of instructions in tiny print. Uh, t let me ask you, would you read 34 pages of small print instructions? Or would you try to just figure it out yourself? Well, you know the answer. So the warnings are real important. Now you have to pick and choose the hazards. You can't just have danger, 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 danger for 17 things. You gotta pick and choose the most, and the most dangerous thing about, about blue light devices is blindness. It's a very simple thing. You could smile, it burns, but most of the time, the serious injury has to do with blindness. So that's easy. Pick and choose that one and put it on the box. I'm putting a sticker right on the device. I'm putting a label in the instructions unit. I'm doing everything except put a sticker on the nose of the dental hygienist. Probably need to do that too. So yeah, instructions are different than warnings. A warning is something that Look, this is a warning. It's not a good one. I didn't design this one because it doesn't tell you what can happen, but it shows you what can happen. You can fall and hurt yourself. Since I've had quadriplegia cases, falls from step ladders, uh, I, I, it's like McDonald's hot coffee. So everybody knows McDonald's. Everybody knows coffee's hot. They laughed at Stella. No, oh, yeah, coffee's hot, but the question is, and this is the consequence question, the consequence question, how hot is hot? The knife question, how sharp is sharp? The fall question, how serious is the injury from the fall? And uh, I'm ready for other questions. Okay. I, I um, I believe we'll have time for about two more questions, and I've got two in the queue. Um, if a new scientific research founds that a certain chemical or ingredient in a product is not safe, does the company need to settle a lawsuit for that product, which was assumed to be safe before? Well, you're, you're asking uh, a very uh, good legal question. I cannot, uh, what I'm about to say should carry as much weight as a lawyer 
because I'm not. So I'll just tell you that as a lawyer giving warnings advice here, so they were not warnings experts. So I'm going to give you my opinion and I'm going to base it on the fact that I've been doing this for 42 and a half years. So I've been involved in literally, uh, well, Schiffman's older than I am, so he's done more lawsuits, but I've had well over a couple thousand lawsuits in those 40 years. And uh, based on that, I would tell you that uh, probably the attorney would say, settle the lawsuit because the, the facts don't, you, you don't have good facts. They're going to assume now, uh, it depends on the technicalities of the law as to whether you'll be held for uh, you know, changes in the future for, that weren't there then. But the, the question is always going to come up, what did you know or what should you have known at the time? And this is going to come down to knowledge of the literature, knowledge of the, the food literature, the chemical literature, the scientific medical literature, the health literature. And the juries are kind of funny on this. They're going to think that the manufacturers should be responsible to know about, uh, in this case, product defect means whether the food is safe or not. So, yeah, I would probably, again, I'm not the lawyer doing this talking. I'm Jerry Goldhaber, a warnings expert who's worked in a, how's this for a disclaimer, right? <laughs> giving you a warning. Ignore that advice by this guy. Be like uh, politicians giving you advice on COVID. Oh, did I say that? <laughs> well, it's always good advice to listen to your lawyer. So uh, final question, uh, is there a difference between warning and caution? Yes. Now this gets into, and if I'm assuming that the questioner is getting at what's the difference in the signal words. We, uh, warning, remember, you have to have four ingredients to have a good warning. A signal word, a statement of the hazard, a statement of the consequence, and an instructional component, the do's and don'ts. The signal word is typically, and, and the signal word means any word that signals we've got a warning. It says, hey, we have a warning here. It's to get your attention. Pay attention. This is a warning. It's got a signal word. What words we use are typically, and this has evolved over the years, into the big three. It's not the only ones you could use, but these are the big three. Danger, warning, and caution. Danger means, this is according to the ANSI standard that most companies have adopted. Danger means it's an immediate, life-threatening, serious uh, injury can occur from exposure to this very dangerous hazard. It's immediate and it's life-threatening. I call this a third rail, the third rail. You fall on that third rail, you will fry and die. Now, good warning, fry and die. So then the, the word touch and the word warning. Warning is also serious and life-threatening, but not immediate. It can be long-term. I like to call that a cigarette warning. You don't take one puff and you're going to plots from lung cancer. That's Yiddish for die, drop date. You're not gonna. You're not gonna do that. However, if you smoke 20, 30 cigarettes a day for 20 years, there's a good chance you're gonna have some problems with lung cancer, or emphysema, COPD, God knows what else. So there's a pretty good chance. That's what I call long-term hazardous effect. That is the word warning. Very different than third rail. Third rail, you're gonna you're gonna get hurt right away. And finally, caution. Caution is a signal word where we tone it down. Okay, it's not so serious or life threatening. It may or may not happen immediately. That has nothing to do with the use of the word caution. It may be now. It may be later. But it's less important. You might break some bones. Maybe bruise yourself. Uh, but it's not really going to be a threat to your life. Unfortunately, most people, I mean, they used caution, uh, caution, McDonald's today. I, I'll tell you, I, I cannot see how they can continue to do it except to make so much money right off the lawsuits. But the word on their, on their cup today says caution hot. Two words, caution hot. And they're still making it as hot as they did when Stella scalded himself. That's not a warning. 
it's certainly not the right signal, and it's certainly not a statement of the hazard. And more importantly, it's not conspicuous. If you look at it, it's white print on a pale orangey yellow background, intentionally hiding the warning. So, you no, know, caution should be used when the effects are limited, and uh, warning should be used when they're more serious, but long term, danger when serious long, uh, but not long term when they're immediate. I hope I've answered that question. Uh, you have. Uh, so uh, I have a coffee cup here from one of our local stores, and it says on it, um, attention, and then show, which is French, caution hot, and precaution caliente. So it does have three uh, three languages here. I believe that's all the time we have. Uh, so I will turn things over to Molly so she can wrap it up. Thank you very much to everybody. Thank, thanks, Eric. And um, we'll do a, a virtual round of applause for you, Dr. Goldhaber. Really, really appreciated your um, informative and um, energetic talk today. Uh, reminded why we loved you so much when you were with us in Providence a few years ago. Um, and certainly hope we can we can have you back in person when when the conditions warrant it. Um, I'd, al I'd also like to, to thank um, Sean uh, McEwen from Graphic Packaging, who who runs this series for us, and um, Eric Brown and ConAgra Brands for sponsoring this fall webinar series. Just a, a quick um, note, if I may, about um, additional opportunities for continuing education at MP. Um, we aren't letting the pandemic slow us down, so we are going to bring you some more programming next week by way of our fall seminar. Uh, the new normal, navigating the microwavable food industry. Uh, we have a fantastic lineup, about 12 speakers, three great moderators, <clears throat> and um, we'll be covering everything from consumer, consumer behavior to uh, clean labeling to uh, solid state, smart kitchen, uh, product development in the time of a pandemic. We've got Tupperware coming. We've got uh, the president of Sharp Consumer Electronics. Uh, Lynn Dornblazer from Mintel will be there, um, the Food Safety Inspection Service, and uh, companies like Tate and Lyle, uh, Brandimation, and 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 many others. We just we just secured our final speaker on um, AI automation, a fellow who has a, a new um, uh, cooktop device that's really really interesting that's just launched to market, and um, we're really looking forward to uh, both the the featured talks and some very good panel discussions. So. There is still time to register for that event. We have just under 50 attendees to date, but um, that doesn't kick off till Tuesday, October 20th. Um, we offer individual day passes for members or non-members, company-wide passes. If you have any questions, I encourage you to, to shoot me or Alicia an email, uh, but we'd certainly love to see you there for that event. Um, also, that's Tuesday to Thursday of next week. On Friday, our solid state RF energy section is having their annual business meeting from 9 to 11 a.m. Um, they'll be conducting their elections and talking about their path forward for the for the for the year ahead. Um, so, a couple of opportunities next week. Um, with that, I thank all of you uh, most importantly for taking your time out of your busy schedules to be here with us today. And um, as long as long as you keep coming, we'll keep having these. So, thank you again, and look for an email from me in the coming days with um, some some contact information and thanks from Dr. Goldhaber. Um, and I hope you have a great rest of your day. Thanks again. Thank you.